Good morning, everyone. This is Ali Danani from BakerBots, and welcome to BakerBots webinar series part two, Blockchain, Rough Edges, and Regulations. So today we'll be talking about a few issues um, that build on the blockchain discussion that we had previously. Uh, I'm Ali Danani. I'm a partner in the Houston office of BakerBots and IP. And on the line with me, I also have Jamie Lin, who's a partner in our DC office in IP. Together, we'll discuss some of the uses that we've made, that other companies have made of blockchain technology, and some of the legal issues those companies have faced as they go through the process of developing this technology for their companies. We'll start by uh, a little reminder on what blockchain technology is and smart contracts. We'll only spend a few minutes on that, given that we covered that substantially in the first webinar that we did. Um, and please, if any of you have questions, feel free to ask them throughout, and we'll get to them uh, basically as soon as we see them and as soon as we can answer them, we'll get those and raise those questions. So jumping right into a reminder of blockchain, uh, for those that are new on the call and for those that uh, perhaps heard the presentation last time, the key in blockchain is that the concept of blockchain came out in 2008. It came out and its first implementation was through the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. We won't spend any time today discussing cryptocurrency and how they've operated because the focus will be on the use of blockchain to develop and implement solutions to existing problems for industries that don't relate to cryptocurrency at all. Blockchain, as a reminder, is basically a ledger. It's a digital database. Think of it as a, an Excel file, frankly, with a bunch of cells where you can update and add data to it. Except the difference here is in blockchain, you can store that distributed ledger, and it is stored on a distributed network of computers. And basically, any participant in that blockchain can add records to that blockchain. So for example, if you have an Excel sheet that's available online for everyone to share and use, anyone can go in and add data. But the difference is that the spreadsheet or ledger is protected by cryptography. So anytime you have a transaction that occurs on the blockchain, it's broadcast to all of the nodes on the network so that they can verify by the mining process whether that transaction should be added to the chain. And once it's added to the chain, it links together with the previous block using a cryptographic hash, and all of these tie back together, which makes the blockchain basically for our purposes immutable. So you can't go back and change anything that you've added to the chain. And you'll see this issue, and I raise it, because some of the issues that we'll talk about on the legal side and the practical side go back to this um, issue of immutability. So each block that gets added contains transaction details. It's timestamped, and that timestamp can't be altered. So even as you're hearing this, you can think of various uses that blockchain would be applicable to, especially in the context of evidence for us as lawyers to timestamp certain uh, dates and records of when things are happening. Turning to one of the uh, advancements in blockchain, so to speak, is smart contracts. Smart contracts are self-executing agreements that are coded onto the blockchain. And instead of the physical signature that both parties would make, they're cryptographically signed, similar to how you would in, an, in the case of an exchange of a cryptocurrency. So a simple example of the use of a smart contract is uh, you could have two parties that have negotiated to essentially deliver a product and receive a payment. And at every step prior to a smart contract, they would have to have some verification in place and some personnel in place that managed that process, made the payments, verified the delivery. Whereas in the context of a smart contract, all of this could be coded such that when workers scan certain IDs and they're verified, you could begin work on a process. When a finished product gets delivered and gets scanned in, you could have a smart contract that triggers a payment. 
And all of these can be automatically done sort of and executed without having all the transactional costs that are now necessary to make sure that these agreements um, basically uh, get accomplished. So Ethereum was one of the first platforms that added this smart contract functionality to the blockchain. Now, one of the keys of understanding smart contracts is, first of all, it's written in code. There's not a written document that one-to-one -one corresponds with how you write something into code. So there has to be, when two parties are coming and there's a meeting of the minds, if you remember traditional contract law, uh, you have to have some sort of agreement in advance. So this is going to require that lawyers at least have a better understanding of the uses of it and work with coders or work with programmers that are going to be needed to implement what the business wants into a smart contract computer code. Um, and the simplest way to explain when a smart contract can be used is the concept of an if condition. So if this happens, then that happens. When you have that simple logic that you can that you've put in a contract, if delivery occurs, payment occurs. If the person is verified, entry is granted. If the lease payment is made, access is given to the car. Uh, all of those and the use cases, they range from all over. I've got a few there, energy, law, supply chain, real estate, construction. All of those are current uses that are happening of smart contracts. And Jamie Lynn is going to go into some of those use cases in a little bit more detail here. Thank you, Ali. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction there and the reminder of some of the basics of blockchain, the fact that these are decentralized ledgers and that they're immutable. That means you can't change them. Um, um, my, uh, let's make sure I'm on the right slide. I'm going to go through some of the, the nifty, I'll say nifty use cases of blockchain in some of the different industries and how they're actually being used and what some of the proposals are. And then we can talk about the regulations and how existing regulations might impact on those use cases and also maybe the way that the blockchains are developed and what companies should be thinking about. So uh, one, one use case is in the medical industry, and I think there's been bandied about quite a lot of talk about maybe, maybe all of our medical records could be stored in the blockchain, and I think we're, we're probably pretty far from that. But there are some, uh, some companies out there that are developing and implementing blockchain solutions to uh, medical industry issues. And so one of those is a startup called Hashed Health, they have a number of products that are out there for the medical industry. One of those is called the Preven Professional Credential Exchange, and it's just what you'd imagine. Um, it's for state licensing of medical service providers. Um, you can store those licenses on the blockchain, and then when a uh, service provider goes to a hospital or to some other facility, the facility can confirm their licensure status and verify that, yes, this is a doctor. They are licensed to perform surgery or to do whatever other medical procedures need to be done. Right now, it's a lengthy process and an expensive one to confirm that for, for hospitals and service providers. Um, Hashed Health also has a product called Bramble, which is uh, intended to be a blockchain-based um, healthcare marketplace. So the idea is that service providers can offer their service. So uh, doctors and clinics and labs can offer their services on the blockchain, and then consumers, which are in this case are not end-user consumers, but are things like self-insured uh, employers, can uh, engage and contract with the, uh, the service providers and vice versa. A, um, a self-insured employer could put up that they need certain kinds of services and a health healthcare provider could accept the contract. And all of that would be available on the blockchain. We've also got interesting uses in the supply chain. So uh, IBM has a, a product called Food Trust that's being used by Walmart to track produce. And there's a, a nifty little diagram at the bottom there. And it just shows the, the tracking using the blockchain from basically farm to customer. Uh, and the concept is that in the blockchain is stored. Sorry, my Apple Watch is, is listening. Um, the, uh, from, the, from the farmer, the farmer would, in, would input on the blockchain the, um, uh, the fact that certain fruit was delivered. It would go to a packing house. And you can see it, it just tracks the entire supply chain. One of the important uses here is not just that you can track it, but you could potentially add um, payment options there such that when produce gets to a processor or a distributor, it would trigger payments that go back down the chain and waterfall down to the suppliers, the transportation 
but it also allows the end consumer to confirm the authenticity of the food. For example, in China, um, it's important to customers to make sure that the eggs they bought came from a farm and are actually eggs uh, that are organic. Um, also in the supply chain space, IBM has a product called Trade Lens, which is, um, in, in, the, uh, in the context of shipping, uh, I guess fairly, fairly simple. The idea is that you can track your shipments. It helps with logistics, helps with customs, and IBM developed that with Maersk, and there is a competing blockchain solution called the Global Shipping Business Network, which is from five ocean carriers and a few terminal operators. And the idea is, is basically the same thing, to use the blockchain to track from uh, the purchaser to the delivery and track it all the way sh through the, the shipping channels. We've also got some interesting solutions in the context of construction. It's a, a fairly regulated industry. So um, while regulations can be a problem, sometimes the blockchain can, can help with regulations. Um, in, the in the construction context, uh, procurement has been suggested and is being developed. So um, service providers like painters and steel workers, companies that provide those services, or even itself, the, the paints, uh, windows, those sorts of materials, you can track those and you can have payments triggered in the supply chain uh, based on certain events that happen in the building. For example, um, the, the window manufacturer might get a certain amount of payment at certain intervals and then upon final inspection and the certificate of occupancy or whatever the equivalent is, once that's verified, it would trigger full payment for uh, any of the services or the materials. Um, the blockchain is also being looked at in the context of building information modeling and so um, that concept of BIM or BIM is not itself new. It's the idea that you would have a, maybe a 3D digital model of the building and you would use that during the planning phase and it would help you to figure out how many square feet of paint that you'd need for walls and how, how many uh, feet of pipe of what kind you'd need in a building. So that would be useful in the, in the context of, uh, of planning. And if it's on the blockchain, it also allows everybody, all of the service providers from the general contractor all the way down to the um, uh, other service providers, the subcontractors, to know exactly what was the design of the building and what their role in it, in it is, and it allows better tracking of where things go wrong and where things go right. Um, also in the construction real estate context, obviously, uh, as Ali mentioned, you can timestamp things, and so we've got interesting uh, applications in land registration uh, in places in the developing world where maybe they don't have the best records as to land ownership. Certainly the blockchain can come in there. And there's one specific company, uh, Brick, that we've got listed here. They are implementing the, some of these construction, um, construction concepts uh, related to things like the building information modeling system. And it's useful, what, what their, their proposal is, is useful from the perspective of building a building, um, but also it's being used and intended to be used for later on after a building is built. Then you can use it for operational purposes. You can see what kind of pipe was installed, uh, if, if there's a recall on certain uh, electrical service boxes, all those things are being used and can be used for operations. And then going one step further, conceptually, if multiple uh, service providers and, and construction companies are to use the blockchain, it also gives a lot of public data that can be used for predictive services. So, for example, if a certain kind of construction or a certain service provider uh, typically comes in uh, over, over cost or delayed, it allows you to have predict predictability, and that's especially important for large-scale products or projects so that you can figure out, all right, well, we think we're going to have a cost overrun in this sec section where this kind of uh, construction typically has these issues and these costs. So it allows better predictability, and that's especially useful in the government context. And then finally, uh, going from giant buildings down to uh, smaller things, there's interesting uses in the anti-counterfeit and royalty tracking space. So, for example, there are a few companies, Block Verify and Scan Trust, uh, that are building blockchains to track uh, goods and to, and to combat counterfeits. So the idea is that, that expensive things, things like pharmaceuticals or luxury items or electronics, that it's important that you can confirm the authenticity that those things are tracked in the blockchain so that a consumer or a buyer or a store can know that they're getting the real deal. So if you buy a Birkin bag or an iPhone, you know that it's, it's an actual Birkin bag or an actual iPhone. And once again, there, there are two companies that are actually doing this now. Um, we also have an interesting application in, in royalty tracking. So one of the big issues in uh, payment of royalties for streaming music and, and other uh, media content um, is it's hard to track who the money is owed to. So there's been a lot of talk recently about metadata about music. So a, a song might have a writer 
It could have a performer, editors, producers, and everybody might have a cut of the royalties. But if it's not tracked easily and in, in a way that is, is standardized, then it's hard to figure out who needs to be paid when somebody plays something on Spotify. So there are companies out there, Dot Blockchain Media, that is uh, working on a blockchain product where when a song is released or when a song is recorded, the, um, the song, it's the, the information about the song is recorded on the blockchain and it can then later be authenticated and you know who has the actual copyright and who is actually owed the, um, the royalties on that. So having talked about all of those, um, those nifty use cases and, uh, and all, all of the uh, interesting ideas people have for blockchain, um, let's turn to uh, I, uh, issues that lawyers might want to think about when our clients, when our developers come to us and say that they have an interesting idea for the blockchain. Um, what, are, what are things about the blockchain that um, we should pay attention to? So um, we've sort of broken these up into two categories. We know that uh, smart contracts are automated. Ali was giving the example of the if-then statements. So things, uh, once, once a trigger happens, the event automatically happens. So there's automation that's associated with smart contracts and blockchains. But there's also this decentralization aspect, the idea that the information is held all over the place and that there's not one central authority that controls it all. And there's a few issues that can arise out of these, and so we'll touch on a few of them. <clears throat> In the automation context, one of the issues is the validity and the enforceability of smart contracts. So as Ellie mentioned, we, we have traditional contract principles where there's an offer, there's an acceptance, there's consideration, there's usually a writing, there's a signature. It doesn't always have to be uh, in paper. You know, certainly you can, um, you can buy a house electronically now. Um, but up until recently, there hasn't been a, a law that specifically says, what if there is a, an entry on a ledger, a blockchain uh, a blockchain ledger somewhere, does that qualify as a, as a contract? And how would you enforce that? And there is, um, there is the Uniform Electronic Transaction Act, Transactions Act, which allows people to enter contracts and to, uh, to sign things electronically. There's, there's nine states now that have uh, amended those acts to expressly say that um, blockchain and cryptographic signatures are considered electronic signatures. And so you could potentially go into a court of law and say this is the contract, and you, you could uh, attempt to prove it up and enforce it. I think the other, uh, the other big state not listed there that is considering it right now is New York. I believe that's up for this session um, to, to amend their, their laws. Um, but it is an issue if you're in a state or if you're trying to enforce a, um, a blockchain contract, uh, if there's been a breach that is, uh, as to whether you can actually prove up the contract and what would be the, the proofs if you were to go up into court and try and do that. Um, also the issue of uh, information accuracy. So the blockchain itself does not confirm whether you've typed the wrong, the right number, you've paid the right person or not. Um, there is no, no reversal for most of the blockchains as, as they've been developed. You can't just reverse a, 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 a transaction. Um, and so when we input information, we have to make sure it's exactly right. Um, and then there are also traditional contract defenses, you know, frustration, illegal purpose, impracticability, all of those defenses are much more difficult in the context of an automated if-then system where you, are, where you have contracts that are being entered into and it's essentially code. Uh, those are hard, hard defenses to make. And then some of the, the limitations, we, we obviously can't encode uh, best efforts into, the, into a, a smart contract, so we have to think about the kinds of things that we can put into smart contracts. And uh, you know, we all know as we've gone through our practice that sometimes agreements need to be changed and we need to have updates. Well, the fact that the blockchain is immutable um, creates its own issues as to how do, you, how do you develop a blockchain that allows you to make amendments if they're necessary, and, have, and you have to anticipate those things um, to the extent that they happen. And here we have an example of, uh, of Nevada. Nevada is actually a, a very pro-blockchain state. Um, and they, uh, they expressly inter included um, blockchain in their definition of an electronic record, and uh, blockchain entries and blockchain transactions are given the same uh, treatment as traditional electro electronic contracts. So they're a, a very, and I, I believe Nevada has also passed some regulations to, to not tax blockchain um, transactions. So they're, they're very, a very pro-blockchain state. <clears throat> we mentioned automation, and what does that mean, and how does that impact on how we might consider certain blockchain uh, use cases. Uh, decentralization also creates some other issues, and we'll, we'll dive deeper into each of these in turn. 
Um, what comes out of the decent decentralization, the issues that we think about are issues related to data. So that is, if your blockchain, um, if your use case stores personal data, it might be subject to some of the privacy regulations. You know, privacy, even in the U.S. right now, is, is a pretty hot topic. Um, but certainly in the EU with the GDPR, uh, there are a lot of data protection regulations and data privacy regulations that we need to think about in a system that is decentralized and that can store a lot of kinds of information. Um, and I'll talk about uh, GDPR in one moment, and I think Ali will touch on some of the, uh, the U.S. statutes that we see coming out um, in this. And then Ali will also talk on the jurisdictional issues related to how, how do you figure out where you're going to sue somebody if you do have a breach or you do need to sue on a smart contract, and then some of the IP issues as well. So I, th I think a, a good use case or a good um, subject to think about the privacy issues and this data decentralization issue is the GDPR. And so I, I recognize that you know, a, lot of, um, a lot of companies might not, uh, might not care that much about the GDPR if they're only U.S. focused, if they're only U.S. centric, but most companies that are implementing a blockchain are going to be uh, implementing it on a global scale, and it's hard to control where exactly the, uh, the participants in the blockchain are. So we, if we should think about block, uh, GDPR and the issues that it creates, and we should also remember that the GDPR is being used as a model uh, for a lot of privacy uh, regulations and statutes that are being passed in the U.S. So um, I don't want this, this to be a GDPR uh, webinar, but it is an important uh, concept to look at. So the, um, the European Parliament is actually fairly uh, progressive on that, and they have formed what they call the European Union Blockchain Observatory and Forum. And it's actually, you know, it's a, it's a parliamentary uh, commission that they've set up, so it has the, the stamp of approval of the EU, uh, and they've released some, some very good uh, information and some very good guidance on um, how the GDPR uh, impacts and interferes and conflicts in some ways with blockchain. And one of the things that they say is there's no such thing as a GDPR-compliant blockchain technology. There are only GDPR-compliant use cases and applications. And I think that's a good, uh, a good intro to what, what we mean. Um, it, it probably makes sense to give a little bit of a context of what uh, – what, what is the, the, the purpose of the GDPR, and how did it come out, or, or how did it actually develop? So the aim of it was to protect personal data, so to prevent companies and individuals from misusing personal data. And I think back to the, the founding of the EU, privacy and personal data has, has been a, a protected um, part of, of human rights in, in the EU for, since its founding. Um, one of the, the interesting parts about it is that it was developed, it was conceived, it was written before blockchain really became what it is today. And so in the universe that they were drafting the GDPR in, uh, big data was all held in a centralized location. So uh, Amazon or Google or Yahoo would be a central third party, and so they would control data, and therefore they would be uh, the most obvious target to regulate to try and um, protect personal data. Um, the problem with that is that blockchain, which also has as one of its goals to – uh, prevent the misuse of personal data and allow people to have better control over their data um, is not centralized. It's actually decentralized. And so a lot of the concepts, the way that the GDPR um, uh, is written, is, is sort of is written without the, the idea that, that blockchain would exist. And so uh, there are some people that say, and, and we'll talk about some of those, that there's, there's some conflicts between GDPR and some of its requirements that, uh, that make it difficult to, to implement blockchain. And also, you know, we have seen certain blockchain projects that have shut down as a result of, of GDPR. Um, two uh, relatively simple concepts, uh, the, you know, definitions. You know, personal data with respect to the GDPR is any information related to a data subject, and that we will find out in the, uh, in, in the next slide. That the data subject is any real person, any, any natural person. So personal data is all data about a natural person. Um, and processing is pretty much anything you might do to uh, personal data. From the context and, and uh, thinking about it from the context of a centralized controller and a centralized processor, the GDPR identified three sort of characters in its regulations. Those are the data subject, so that's your, the natural person um, that you could identify with the data. And then you have the data processor and the data controller. The data processor would be the, you know, could be a third party that stores or um, runs algorithms on data, and the controller is really the minds and the, the brains behind it. So we have these, these three characters. We've got the subject, the processor, and the controller. And the processor and the controller could be the same person. 
And the idea behind the GDPR is to protect the data subject from the data processor and the data controller. And so it sets out a, a number of what they call guiding principles. So a, the use of, um, of data about a data subject, it has to be lawful, it has to be fair, it has to be transparent. Um, the use of data can only be uh, used for what, was, what the, the use was agreed to. So if, uh, if I give consent to use my data for one purpose, it can't be used for another purpose. Um, you can only connect, collect as much data as is necessary to satisfy the purpose. There has to be a, an ability to correct or delete data um, if it's incorrect. And it can only be kept uh, as long as it's necessary uh, and, and only what is necessary for the purpose. So if certain data is needed to start a, a function but it's no longer needed to continue the function, then you have to delete it. And then there are certain uh, security uh, protocols and safeguards that are applicable, but it's not, not necessarily as, as important on, to the decentralization issue. Um, and what comes out of all of this and what comes out of the, the requirements are what I, what I would consider sort of the four, the four big issues that would touch on blockchain. One is rectification. Somebody has to be able to correct data. Um, data has to be able to be erased. And those two issues are important because, as we know from Ali's intro, uh, most blockchains are immutable. So the idea that you could change something or that you could delete something runs counter to the, almost the whole purpose of it. Um, data subjects access. Data subjects have to have a right to know what is held and how it's being used. But if data is out on a blockchain and there's no centralized person that is, is controlling it, um, how are they supposed to be given access or no, know exactly where the access is or what exactly anybody is using it for? And then there's the territoriality aspect, which is that data can't be transferred from somewhere within the GDPR to anywhere that is not an adequate country. And, but with, with blockchain, we have a theoretically decentralized system where data is held globally and everywhere. So these are potentially conflicting issues. <clears throat> Some of the, uh, the roles and how they impact or how they, they would line up with, uh, with the blockchain, um, the the guidance that we have from the EU is that anybody that could be identified by data would be considered a data subject. And you might say, um, well, you know, what if you, what if you obfuscate somebody's identity or they just have a hashed, um, a hashed value that identifies them, such as in, in Bitcoin, wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that mean they're not identifiable? And one of the problems is that the, uh, the, the leading uh, arguments right now in theory, although it hasn't been confirmed, is that even a hashed value, if you could infer who, a, who the, what the identity of a natural person was, that that hashed value itself would be, um, would be personal data. It would, be, uh, would create a data subject. So even hashed values in, in Bitcoin uh, would potentially be subject to, um, to the GDPR. Um, and then we have to ask who are the processors and who are the controllers. Um, in the, the blockchain universe, there really, aren't, there really isn't a central controller. And there really isn't a, a central processor, um, but we can probably attribute that blockchain miners, and those are the folks that validate the transactions, they're probably going to be considered processors. So they will have obligations to um, do things like delete data, uh, to correct data. Um, so that, that is an issue in an immutable system. Um, and then there's the, the question of people that even access a blockchain accessor, right? So somebody that can read and hold a copy of it, that actually also might qualify you as a processor and subject to you to obligations um, to treat the data as, as the GDPR requires. And then um, even more striking is, is there, there is a suggestion that actual participants, so those folks that make entries onto the blockchain, um, themselves might be data controllers and they would be subject to, um, to the GDPR regulation. Now, of course, if you enter your own data, there's, uh, there's an argument that you've consented and that there are exceptions for that. But, um, for a participant for a third party that's entering other, thir other people's personal data on there, um, somebody that's maybe an intermediary between end users and a blockchain, there's an argument that they're a controller. And then, of course, there's the developers that have developed the tools. Um, is li it's likely, considering that they're, it's mostly open source volunteers for a lot of the, the base level tools, and then it's the implementers that, that stand up the blockchain. Um, but the, the more control you have over the blockchain, the more likely you're going to be subject or as a, a data controller. So going back to these, these four things, um, how you can correct data and how you can erase data are things that we need to think about when we're developing our blockchain um, products. We have, we have to have it built in. 
uh, the ability to at least answer the question of where, where someone's data is and how it's being used, and then um, as best as possible uh, controls as to um, where the data actually is, not necessarily that preventing it from going places, but making sure that the, that the protections are there when it gets to that specific place. And so the, the guidance from the EU blockchain observatory and forum is that um, they are pro-blockchain. The EU is, it wants to be pro-blockchain. They, they don't want to preclude blockchain applications, um, but there are some unique issues with the way the regulations currently sit. And we have this, this circumstance where we have a regulation that was developed long before blockchain and it's still in its development phase without court cases to interpret it at the same time that we have blockchains being developed and they're going forward. And so those, those need to interact. And hopefully there will be some further guidance either through the courts or through regulations that give a little bit more comfort to blockchain implementers. But until then, uh, any blockchain implementer needs to keep these things into consideration when they're actually developing the product. And I think with that, I'll let Ali tell us how we're supposed to do that and what, is, what does that mean? What is the, the solution here? Sure. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, so to give some context here, uh, as Jamie talked about, uh, to kind of put a little bit of a, a, a higher level point on it, when you're designing a blockchain platform, when you're designing a solution, or when you're trying to use blockchain for your business to either implement something, there's a few things you have to consider, one of them being the GDPR. Um, and in order to sort of address the legal issues, you have to frame what your company or what, what solution you're implementing, what sort of data and what sort of processes it actually wants to use the blockchain for. So there's some guidance that's provided by the EU blockchain in terms of some very general overview level questions that you should think about when building a blockchain solution, or at least when signing up for one, or allowing yours or your users or your customers' data to be stored uh, on a blockchain. Uh, one of the first questions to begin with is how is user value created? How is the data used and do you really need the blockchain? Meaning, is this simply a storage mechanism? And if that's all it is, why do you need more than the traditional database structure that's already present, um, even in the sharing context. And if, if there's going to be several parties that you don't trust adding data or exchanging data or at least um, needing to exchange some sort of value, blockchain starts to become a little bit more useful to do that. And then in terms of storing the data itself, what you're actually keeping a track of see if there's a way to avoid storing personal data on the blockchain itself, meaning you could have a record designated by a cryptographic hash or some sort of encryption that only stores that identifier. And then it goes to some very local database that stores the personal data. And the difference is you're not broadcasting out that personal data to all the network nodes on the chain, uh, and you're not sort of storing that data on a blockchain where it's immutable, hard to delete, and all of that. So that's where data obfuscation, encryption, and aggregation techniques come in, meaning don't just store raw data on a public blockchain, even in encrypted form. Um, instead, store some sort of identifier that you can use from a local database or some sort of um, central database to try to get that information. There's different types of blockchain, and we'll look at this a little bit more on the next slides too. There's private versus public. There's permissioned, um, pu public permissioned and public unpermissioned. But generally speaking, the more private a blockchain is, the more likely it is that it's going to comply and there's less of a risk for user data to be uh, basically uh, for that blockchain uh, to be hacked and for user data to be take, taken from that. So what that means is if, if when you see Bitcoin and when you see these other cryptocurrencies, those are all public blockchains, permissionless blockchains, meaning anyone can go on and get on that blockchain and make a transaction. Whereas if you take a private blockchain, you have to be invited or it has to be some sort of agreement between partners uh, or users or, or, or 
different companies to actually use that blockchain. So in the supply chain examples that we've brought up, most of those are going to fall under the category of private permissioned blockchains because those are going to be specific companies that are using the blockchain for either a smart contract reason or some sort of other reason to, for a specific uh, purpose and transaction. Um, and then, of course, as Jamie mentioned, um, the EU is very favorable towards blockchain, and they're encouraging everyone to continue to innovate and be as transparent as possible. I mentioned the public versus private blockchain. In the context, uh, just sort of a cheat sheet for GDPR purposes, if you have a private blockchain, the way that you're storing data, there's some obfuscation there, you're not storing the raw data, you're more than likely going to be compliant with GDPR, um, and presumably these new statutes that are considering how to manage data as well across California, Texas, and some of the other states that Jamie mentioned. If you have a public permission blockchain, meaning the users, that, that they're specified actors that are going to be on that blockchain and passing data back and forth, and they all need to be let in. You're probably going to be compliant depending on other reasons as well because you don't have um, a public uh, forum where anyone could see it. Uh, unlike, for example, I, I go back to the Bitcoin example, you could go back to the very first transaction that ever occurred on Bitcoin or first 100 or first 1,000 and see where the uh, money was exchanged uh, after it was sort of put on the blockchain. Um, public unpermissioned, those are the ones that you hear about the most, Ethereum, Bitcoin, um, XRP, all of these other ones are public unpermissioned blockchain. Anyone can contribute data and everyone possesses an identical ledger copy for an example of a, uh, as an example or as a description of unpermissioned blockchains. So moving from there, some of the big questions that come out of the materials Jamie presented. Um, it, it, there's obviously everyone here uh, has U.S. operations along with worldwide operations. Depending on how you use or how you implement the blockchain, in order to determine what laws would apply, it, you have to think about where those nodes and where those servers that are going to receive the blockchain are going to reside. And of course, if you have a public unpermissioned blockchain, they could be anywhere in the world, so you do have to be aware, and frankly, you have to have your blockchain satisfy any um, sort of these regulations that may exist. Um, so if, you're, if you aim to be compliant with GDPR and some of these other regulations that are coming out, it's more than likely you're going to be compliant with all of these other ones. But of course, that's where your design of the blockchain becomes very critical. Um, you also have to, uh, as we mentioned, some of the other roles, who will the data controller in automated smart contracts be? Meaning who's going to store the data? Who's going to be the network that stores the ledgers? What computers are going to have the ability to do that are all questions you'll have to think about in this implementation context. The other one is, are the rights of data subjects under GDPR compatible with blockchain applications? Meaning in the context of GDPR, users do have rights such as the right to accurate information, the right to forget. You have to think if you're going to store those types of data, how in the future you will allow your users to take advantage of those rights because those are going to be issues that come up in terms of your planning purposes. Um, and, and for example, healthcare blockchain is one that has been brought up. You're, it, it automatically gives some sort of reference to patient records or uh, patient information, those are going to be subject to HIPAA and much, many other privacy concerns that you already have to deal with. Uh, but the right to forget and all of that will become sort of important as you're storing this data on a blockchain. Uh, so some solutions that we've got here to think about, um, for example, for data subject rights, how you implement the right to access or the right to forget. Um, some solutions that are being used, for example, right to access is simple. You need to have some verification process in place that lets the user verify themselves and get access to their data. Um, you need to have some sort of way that you could obfuscate the data to satisfy the right to forget. In other words, you have to have some way to take whatever block is storing that data or whatever would be the, uh, 
the underlying uh, data subject to GDPR and figure out a way to null that block, not delete it because you can't delete it off the blockchain, but maybe insert some data over it that makes that data unusable. And those are some of the solutions that have been proposed to try to implement this right to forget on this blockchain. You have to specify who the data controller would be. For example, moving to the, the second column there, in automated smart contracts, you have two parties that have either, two or more parties that have entered into a contract, but where is the blockchain being stored? If the blockchain is being stored by some third party, for example, you have various other companies that are providing these blockchain solutions, then data controller rights, may, they may need to make available tools to implement or satisfy data controller, li data controller rights. So those are things that um, the GDPR is, is focused on, and these are ways to kind of satisfy those. So, um, you have to make your efforts to comply, and even if, even if they don't get you all the way there, efforts are seen as more favorable than sort of ignoring uh, your obligations to do so. Uh, in the U.S., I know we've spent a lot of time talking about GDPR. That's past law. That, that, that's law that's passed and being implemented, and, and there's some guidance behind that. But the reason we're doing so, as Jimmy mentioned, is there's a lot of counterparts that are being presented in the U.S., California has passed one. Texas is considering one that's a little bit stronger. Uh, Washington uh, is before the House right now. So you have to think about these things because once you have a blockchain in place, it's going to be much harder, uh, at least for a particular way you're doing a transaction, it's going to be harder to go back and try to comply with these laws. Uh, so that's, that's some, some guidance there. Even if, GDP, even if you're limiting your operations to just U.S. and you don't expect any EU or foreign um, information there, you still may be subject to the same guidelines um, if all of these laws come to place all over the U.S. So take a look at the uh, California Consumer Privacy Act. It comes operative on January 1, 2020. Some of the keys there businesses have already started following to some degree. You have uh, businesses that must disclose data collection and sharing practices to consumers. So you may have seen a lot of these um, entities that you've probably signed on for agreements with updating their terms of use and resending those to you. And what they're doing there is they're basically um, getting permission to share your data or not share your data, giving you an opt-out functionality for that sharing, giving you that they're going to be subject to uh, different obligations now for data collection and who they can share with and specifically limiting consumers under age 16 without consent um, from selling their personal data. So uh, there's, there, there's some changes that are being proposed as well to this, but essentially this will be the new privacy law, and if you're doing business in California, you'll be subject to it. Um, and with our economy basically moving towards more, uh, not just national, but sort of worldwide, it's, it's worthwhile to take in, these into account early on as you're planning for what you're doing. Some of the other regulations that we want to bring up right here that are also in the works. Um, these are all different privacy, consumer protection, and um, data breach notification types of laws that are being considered, have either passed the Senate or are at some, some stage of legislative development. And it, some of the impetus for this has come from, you hear uh, how different companies ha have now had major data breaches, Equifax, being one where it had major data breaches, and they Yahoo, another one that may have had some. Uh, but basically, there's different laws that are coming into place for how you notify users of a data breach, what you do in those, um, how data should have been stored to begin with. So one example we've got flag there is that the Data Care Act. It applies to large tech companies that are essentially online service providers meaning anyone that provides any sort of service online, takes in user data, for example, creates a user account. So think of any uh, department store you go and you shop at online, Banana Republic, Macy's, anything. All of them take in your personal data. They could also have your credit card data in there, which would involve your social, your driver's license, uh, your financial accounts. All of those are going to be data that are going to be subject to this new Data Care Act that's being uh, considered here. Um, it's essentially 
going to require uh, permission for any sale of such data and greater protections for the types of data that the, that the, uh, that the service provider can store. Um, another one is the American Data Dissemination Act, and this is essentially a nationalization of the consumer data privacy laws that are sort of collected everywhere. It's, um, it builds on the Privacy Act of 1974, and it's designed to regulate the, and regulate the collection and use of personal data and give users the ability to correct certain records that users may have on this data. Um, another one, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has also released draft legislation, uh, the Federal Consumer Privacy Act. And, and the spirit of all of these and the reason why we're raising some of these and flagging the types of protections that are occurring is to flag for you the issues that you'll have to deal with when you do have either a blockchain or even um, any storage of data that you have because these are the bills that are in the pipeline that are one, going to impact blockchain storage of data, but two, impact your overall business and how you provide online services or store data, sell data, um, or anything of that sort of business activity. So going to the Federal Consumer Privacy Act, similar to what the American Data Dissemination Act aims to do, but it, you've got some points there, empowers consumers through transparency, opt-out, data deletion, it sort of makes it a lot more clear, or at least enforces companies to make a lot more clear when they're using data, when they're selling data, or what they're doing with the data that they collect from users' use of their products, services, uh, or anything of that sort. Um, it'll also, one of the intents of it also is to preempt all state and local privacy laws. So this is on the flip side, and this is more to assist businesses, because in order to comply with regulations in all 50 states, it, it would take it takes a, a little bit higher burden or a lot higher burden to to do that than it would be to comply with one consistent federal act on that front. So turning to some of the jurisdiction points and the IP points here, um, as with any blockchain, there there's going to be several players, and they're likely going to be distributed, not even just in the U.S., but also worldwide. So it, it'll take some sort of consideration and, and analysis to figure out what state's law to apply, where you could sue potential parties, and all of those are going to be some tough issues to deal with in terms of um, governing um, blockchain. For example, you use a third-party solution provider for blockchain, and they have a network node of computers, but they for one reason or another, have an issue with their blockchain that requires litigation. Where do, you, where do you end up suing them if they're either located in U.S., not located in U.S., or using servers spread across the world? That's going to be a, a challenge. Um, one of the solutions and that, that are being considered are whether you can enforce and treat terms of use and put those in when you develop a blockchain. And that could cover governing law, choice of law, forum, maybe whether you could limit trial or not, or how you could do that. Uh, there have been discussions of whether specialized courts need to be set up, or at least specialized law that deals with smart contracts as codes rather than um, the traditional principles of written contract law. Um, and, and then you have to think about whether the terms of use for users of your blockchain would impact how that blockchain would be used or perceived are implemented, whether you use U.S., whether you go, whether you use Europe, and all of that. Um, but, but taking the, so, so taking that jurisdiction point aside, you also have to worry about jurisdictional reach of the contracting parties and operators. If you have someone that's not located here and you're trying to sue them here, jurisdiction will be an issue. Of course, if you go back and think about the concepts of specific jurisdiction, whether they signed on or not. The fact that foreign, jurist, foreign corporations can be sued anywhere if they don't have a residence, all of those laws will come into place, but you still have to get that company um, basically it, some way to make that company subject to not only the law that you want, but also relief that you want at the end. 
those have to be considerations that get taken into account in this development. Um, we'll go ahead. I, I, I still have a, we still have a few more minutes here, but we will go ahead and release the number for the CLE. Let me pull that up right here. And that is 49473. Again, that's the code for the CLE presentation to get your CLE credit. That's 49473. Now, turning back to the smart contracts, this is one where you can include law and jurisdiction within the contract and as part of the agreement itself. And that the courts are looking at considering that as a basis for enforcing those provisions as well. So turning finally to, to brief comments on intellectual property, uh, it, though the underlying blockchain concept was publicly disclosed in the white paper in 2008, uh, there have been several thousand patents filed through early 2019, and the bulk of those filings occurred between 2015 to early 2018, and then it's been a steady stream since then. So it, this is just because the underlying concept of blockchain has been disclosed, kind of similar to how the Internet concept was disclosed. There is very strong potential for protection in IP, and it should definitely be considered if your company is looking to implement solutions in the blockchain context. Uh, certain types of patents that have issued just for reference, storing types of behavior, behavioral data on a blockchain and using that to generate some profile information on a user or customer, protection against crypto ransomware attacks, multi-currency blockchain storage, serving customized um, ads using tracking via storage on blockchain, uh, preserving privacy in a transaction for validation purposes, and transaction management. Those are just a few of some of the patents of the thousands of patents that have issued, that are issuing quickly, and that have been filed. So you do want to consider this type of protection. Um, there have also been lots of sort of networks that have decided to keep this trade secret, um, especially in private blockchain. That's one concept to consider as well. And then, of course, in the context of copyrights, uh, if you're going to be developing smart code, uh, that is a software program. And, and the software program, you can file a copyright on code so long as it's new code. Um, and, and it's, it's not sort of your general foundational code that you're using across platforms. So those are some of the intellectual property issues. Um, we can always take some questions, and, and I know we have one here as well. Um, so I'll turn to the questions for the moment. Uh, and and I, this one, I may, have, I, I may have just seen it a little bit late. Do you ex the question is, do you expect the final legislation to be packaged as one federal bill? Uh, so the answer to that is um, th there's two sides to it. That would be nice and if everything were packed as sort of one large federal bill, but given that different senators have sponsored these and they have sort of different goals when they do sponsor these types of bills, um, I'm not sure if that will uh, ultimately happen because it, you already have three big ones that are being considered, the Data Care Act, the American Data Dissemination Act, and another sort of federal um, act concerning consumer data. Um, it would be good if all of them do get packaged as one large federal bill. There's certainly the tech company sides, the lobbying efforts are certainly pushing for that, so the, they don't have multiple things that overlap and maybe conflict with each other. But I, I don't, I, there's been no movement in that direction that I've seen so far. And, and I'll, I'll add to that. I think um, you know, there's a few a few sticking points that are sort of holding it up right now. I think it was originally supposed to be a bilateral kind of effort because everybody wants to protect privacy, and it seems like a popular thing to do. Um, but two of the big sticking points are the state preemption issues. So we've got uh, states like Washington and California that have these, these privacy acts that they're pushing forward on their own, and they want to have the ability to regulate on their own and give their um, – you know, their citizens uh, certain rights and certain abilities to um, uh, protect their data. Uh, so there, there are, I think the, the Democrats are pushing for the, um, that the, any regulations do not preempt the states, uh, while, on the, while on the Republican side, and I think the U.S. Chamber is pushing for a, um, 
a bill that would would preempt the states and have one unified uh, one unified act. And then I believe that the latest skirmish right now is whether uh, pri- a private right to action would be included um, in any kind of uh, any kind of bill. So the idea being that if my data were to be uh, hoovered up and vacuumed up and misused, could I have a private right of action under the statute to go after any of the, the violators of the data? Um, and once again there, the, the Democrats, I think, are holding the position that there should be a, a private right of action. Um, and the, the Republican side, and I think the, probably the tech companies are well as well are, are pushing more for a, uh, a regulatory scheme and an enforcement scheme, but not allow private, uh, private suits and, and things that will cause uh, additional litigation and additional expense in that context. So I think those are two big stumbling blocks that are out there right now. <clears throat> I think one of the other questions that came in, Ali, was about, um, I guess, how, how if, the, uh, if, a, if a company wanted to do one of the supply chain or the medical um, use cases, how would they actually structure it so that they could comply with GDPR? What would be some suggestions that, that, that we could give on that? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Or? Yes. Um, the, one of the key points is how you store data. Uh, as much as you can, avoid storing the data directly on the blockchain and instead store uh, references to it. Some of the other ways to comply are consider how you would uh, build that blockchain to allow for blocks to be uh, basically updated, deleted, or removed, or basically remove references to it so you couldn't access that data block anymore. Um, And then consider how far you wanted the network of nodes to store the data, store the ledger itself, and and consider some limitations to the network, sort of the ledger nodes themselves. And those are a few of the the technical issues that address the legal issues for right to forget. Um, um, and then consider the permission versus permissionless. If you can do permissioned and private, that would be better. Yeah, and, and I'll add, I, th- I think for, for some of these, especially in the context of a, of a, of a blockchain that has a controlled uh, group of users, so even in the context of, a, of the, food, um, uh, the food supply chain, you know, the specific farmer, uh, there might be personal data about a specific farmer, but you can uh, you can get consents, and, and the GDPR and the other privacy regulations allow you to, to get consent. So if you know who the users are going to be, and if you have a very structured sort of input mechanism as when they come in, um, what data is going to be stored about them, and you follow the regulations as to informing them what's going to happen with the data and why it's going to be there, and they have those the ability to uh, to take their personal data off after it's done, um, you have a much much higher chance of of being in compliance with these, these privacy regulations. And that's, I think that sort of stems back to what you were talking about with the permissioned, permissionless, um, and, and wanting to have a permissioned, uh, even if it's public, but it's a permissioned system, so only personal data of people that have consented to it um, is actually on there. Yeah. Some of the other questions that have come in, one of them, what are examples of how amendments are addressed in a blockchain environment? A very, very good question there. That is something that, um, that parties are considering and, and courts are frankly struggling, are, are going to struggle with because, um, so, so some of the ways that they're being addressed now is frankly by stopping and modifying the blockchain and, and sort of starting and forking off and using a new blockchain for that example um, transaction. But there's a lot of transaction costs with that because there is no, as you said, there's no way once you enter into a smart contract, until that smart contract is done, as an example, you can't amend it because the point of it is you take away the ability to breach, and that's the benefit of the smart contract. So if you go to court and that the court orders an amendment or something like that, or the parties want to do an amendment, they essentially have to draft a new smart contract, and there's transaction costs there that that are not in the traditional contract model where both parties can just agree to do something different. So good question. Um, the, the, the base way that people have done it is by replacing it all together. Some other ways, if it has to do with amending what you're storing of data, they um, basically use a different block. It doesn't replace the block, but it's treated as sort of this is the new operative block that, and the prior block doesn't apply anymore. 
but no, that, that's a good question because that's, people are dealing with that issue now. I think, Jamie, there's another question there. Do you want to take that one? Sure, and the, the question is how are laws requiring local storage of their citizens' data being addressed uh, in China, India, and uh, in Russia? So I, I think the issue there is that we have sort of uh, global um, regulations that require data about citizens to be stored locally. Um, and uh, as, far as, as far as I'm aware, um, it's been addressed at least in the, in the context of regular data in, in the fact that you would have your data sources simply uh, included in, and located in those countries. Um, there hasn't been, I, have, I haven't seen any uh, restrictions on the territoriality of a blockchain, but that you would say this is not permitted to cross uh, from uh, Russia or in, into Russia or vice versa. I haven't seen any, any specific blockchain implementations there. And I think it would probably be a difficult thing to implement. So it might be one of those, one of those situations where the regulation itself is, is directly conflicting with whatever the, blockchain, um, whatever the blockchain use case is. The other way that you could potentially deal with it, I think, goes back to what Ali was uh, addressing before, is that if, if you only store in the blockchain the reference to a locally stored set of data, so if the personal data about the Russian or the Chinese citizen, um, if the actual personal data is stored on computers that are locally um, sited there in those countries, and the only thing that's on the blockchain is the reference to it and the address, and that part um, uh, is, is controlled, then I think you would probably comply with those regulations because technically the data isn't, um, isn't floating around the, the world. It's just a reference to that data. Okay. Uh, well, wanted to thank everyone for joining again. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll be continuing the webinar series and sending future uh, invites for that. And I thank everyone for their time today. And we really appreciate you all joining and listening. Thanks so much.